the ultimate source of the Bible? Who is the ultimate source of the Bible? God. God. You hear that? Yes. All right. How many human writers approximately are there? Four. Just stand, four. jump up. Forty. You have 40. All right. How many years span is there between the Old Testament and the New Testament? 1,500 years. 1,500? All right. Everybody agree with that? The Old Testament was written in what language? Hebrew. 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 All right. Which other language again? Greek. Greek. Aramaic. All right. And the New Testament was written in what language? Greek. At what time did the King James Version came about? 1611. 1611. Now everybody's going to know that. Okay? Everybody likes King James Version. All right. You're doing good. You're doing good. All right. Now, let's just look, review a little bit on lesson number two. God's word to us. We use the term of the words revelation, inspiration, and illumination. I'm sure you hear it a lot of time, right? Now, when we use the word revelation, what we are simply saying, it is the work of the Holy Spirit. I'm an individual where the Holy Spirit is disclosing to that individual divine truth. It has nothing to do with what we have studied. It is the Holy Spirit work of disclosing divine truth. And uh, those that are preachers and teachers, sometimes you stand before an audience and God will give you life and direct some things for the congregation that you've never studied. Or sometimes you sit in your study and the Spirit of God will just take hold of your mind and your spirit and just give you some and disclose some, some divine truth. Now, there's another term we call illumination. Because revelation given must also be received. Because Bishop can stand here and, and disclose revelation. But you and I need to be illuminated also to understand that truth. So illumination concerns the Holy Spirit work of enabling a people or a person to understand that truth. All right? Because uh, how many times we give a revelation, but some people cannot receive it. So it's important then that uh, we have the illumination, and that comes from the Holy Spirit. Have you ever read a scripture for years and years, and all of a sudden, five, seven, ten years down the road, you read it again, and something just leap out to you? And say, so, my God, I've been reading this for the last 10, 15 years, and never saw this revelation. So the illumination just leaps out at you at that particular time. Inspiration. This we tie this back into the Holy Spirit work of enabling the human authors to accurately receive and record truth. So these writers receive and also record it. This is very powerful. Because you could receive something and distort it by the time you communicate it to a scribe to write it. So inspiration is the, is the Holy Spirit work of enabling these writers of the Bible to receive the truth of God and then record that truth as it was given to you. Remember what the Lord said to, to Moses after he gave him the, the pattern uh, 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 of, of, the, of the tabernacle. He said, make sure you build it according to the pattern that I showed you where on the mountain. All right? And that is important to, to every person. There are four reasons why, as believers, that we need to study the Bible. 
Number one, it is the word of God to man. There will not be another revelation. This book is God's word to man. Don't check any other source. There's not another source. The Bible is God's word to man. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is what? Making wise. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is what? Pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is what? Clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous all together. Number two, why you should study the Word. The Word is alive and active. That's why it is hard for some of us to comprehend that people can receive the Word while it is being delivered and remain still. For if it is alive and active, then once it reaches the heart, there's going to be something happening. The writer of the Hebrews said, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. It is a discerner of the thoughts and intent of the heart. The word of God is quick and powerful. Can't receive it and remain dead. You can't accept it and remain quiet in your seats. It's going to shake you. Glory be to God. Come on, say amen. Can't receive it. So that's why we do not subscribe to a quiet Holy Ghost. That you receive the Holy Ghost and, and, and you just wave your hand. And you know, somebody said, well, you don't have to do all of that. The devil is alive. Once God get on the inside, he's going to shake you. Come on, talk to me. When Isaiah went into the temple, and when the glory of the Lord filled the house, Isaiah had to, 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 to confess that even the doorposts begin to shake. If God get on the inside of you and I, you've got to shake somewhere. Glory be to God. Uh, it seems like sometimes we've got to ask a few apostolic people, have you received the Holy Ghost since you received? Because you, you claim that you got it, but you're still dead. The word is quick. Bishop can't be up here in the McLean preaching, and you just sit there for two hours and just look. Something got to happen on the inside of you. If you eat that word, it's going to be fire, man. Jeremiah had it on the inside and failed to release it out of him, and he said it was like fire. Number three, why we need to study this book, the Word of God effectually works in those that believe. It works in you. Paul writes in Thessalonians and he said, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. Because when he received the word of God, which he heard of us, he received it not as the word of men, but as the word of truth, the word of God, which effectually worketh also in you that believe. It's a working once the word of God gets on the inside, it works on you. It's like a sculptor having a piece of marble. And in his mind, he has an imagery. And every now and then, he goes there with his chisel and trying to bring out of that marble the imagery in his mind. Paul said in Ephesians, we are his workmanship, created unto good works. So every time you come to church, don't come to church only to rejoice. Come for God to work on you. Come on, come on. Because the ultimate purpose of God is that when he's true with you, when he look at you and look at himself, we look the same way. 
Come on, come on. Come. Amen. You know, some of us just come to church just, just to shout and go back. But that's not the ultimate purpose. That's why it's called service. I take my car in for service. We should never say, well, I'm a preacher. Preach at them today. It's us. Because you should find something out of the world that you can go home and make some adjustments. If the word of God is not convicting us to go better, something is wrong. Amen. Number four, the word of God is good for doctrine, for reproof, correction, and instruction. The Paul writes to Timothy and he said, all scriptures is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness that the man of God may be what? All right. What does the word doctrine mean? Come on, don't be scared, don't say it. Yeah. All right. Somebody else? Doctrine. The word doctrine means. The word doctrine means a teaching. And in particular, the area of teaching is called a doctrine. All right. The Apostolic Church has a doctrine. We have, as a matter of fact, we have more than one doctrine. Now, a lot of people say they don't like doctrine. We, we are defensive about doctrinal statements. We resist it sometimes. We call them man-made laws. Don't get quiet on me now. You know that's the truth. All right? But <coughs> Paul is saying that the scripture is good for doctrine. Doctrine is for the saints. We teach the saints doctrines. All right. Hello. There's certain doctrines in the Bible, like the doctrine of God, the doctrine of Christ, the doctrine of demons, the doctrine of men. Of course, men does have a doctrine. And there's the doctrine of the apostles. All right. We talk about the, the teaching and the revelation concerning Christ and God is a doctrine. And, and there is a doctrine concerning the devil and the satanic forces that we have to wrestle with. And uh, we need to understand that, that there is a spirit yes. that is in this world yes, yes. that wants us to fail. Yes. Yes. There is a spirit that yes. opposes you. Yes. There is a spirit that don't want you to come to church. There's a spirit that wants you to sin. There's a spirit that wants you to be depressed. You gotta understand, that is the wiles of the devil moving up on the lives of people. And the devil is not afraid of or shout. Amen. If he can get a hold of our minds and control our minds, then, then we are in He's in control of our entire being. Yes. All right? So we need to know that. Now, the Bible is divided into two testaments. We have the New Testament and the Old Testament. The word testament means what? Covenant. Old covenant, new covenant. All right? It's called testaments. 